Coming up in today's newscast, the White House sides with Israel on the country's right to have a nuclear arsenal. The IDF says it's thwarted multiple attempts to kidnap Israeli soldiers and get ready to snag a ticket because a Broadway musical based on an Israeli film has just received almost a dozen Tony nominations. I'm Natasha Kirchuk and thanks for joining us. Today, a top Iranian official has just promised a swift and decisive response to Israel's recent activities in Syria. Earlier this week, missiles struck a Syrian base where potentially dozens of Iranian nationals are believed to have been killed. Israel has remained mum on any involvement and Syrian state media initially blamed the United States, but top U.S. officials say Israel led the operation. ILTV's Brett Allen Smith is here. And Brett, here's the big question on everyone's mind. Are we looking at the beginning of a war? Well, that's something Israel certainly isn't going to say out in the open. But if you ask a lot of people, then yeah, that is kind of where some of these paths are pointing. Now look, it's nothing new for Iran to threaten a military response like this, right? But right now, Iran kind of has bigger fish to fry because, of course, we're less than two weeks away from pres President Trump's deadline to either renew the JCPOA nuclear deal or else dismantle it, as you so often threaten to do. That's kind of the, the big question. Yeah, well, from right the now. look of things, I'd say most people's money is on that latter possibility that he'll withdraw the U.S. from the deal. And in light of Prime Minister sure. Antonio's bombshell reveal on live TV of intel that was allegedly taken from Iran's nuclear archive, the White House now has this to say. Well, the problem is that the deal was made on a completely false pretense. Uh, Iran lied on the front end. They were dishonest actors. And so the deal that was made was made on things that weren't accurate. Uh, and we have a big problem with that, uh, particularly, sure, particularly the fact that Iran's nuclear capability were far more advanced and far further along than they ever indicated, which if this uh, nuclear deal maintains as it is right now when the sunset provision hits in seven years, they will be much further along in the process and much uh, and able to make a nuclear weapon much quicker uh, than they've ever indicated before. And that's a big. So this could very well be the beginning of the end of the deal. Right. OK, so let's let's talk about that, because ironically, when a lot of people watch Netanyahu's reveal for them, it actually worked totally against his own arguments. Press Secretary Sanders is statement about Trump's, you know, concern that a seven-year expiration date is on the line, that's a big problem for them. But if Trump pulls out of this deal on May 12th, then that expiration date may yeah. come literally the next day. And that's exactly how former Secretary of State John Kerry feels about it. He says if you blow up the deal, then we're back to where Iran was in 2009 tomorrow. And others compare this to the same logic that brought the United States into Iraq, which is, you know, now seen as a fairly disastrous war for all parties involved. So let's see how that argument plays out. If Colin Powell was right, about the intelligence he was presenting, it would have bolstered his case. President, Pr Prime Minister Netanyahu, if he is right, is bolstering the case for the JCPOA. He is describing the reason that we needed to have this agreed set of restrictions on Iran's nuclear program. He's describing the reason for the invasive inspections in Iran. Well, you know, that brings me to the bottom line here, because if Israel knows that blowing up the deal will most likely put Iran back on a path towards nuclear arms, then it'll have no other choice than to go to war. So maybe that's an unavoidable right. scenario right. either way. But for Israel to be 100% sure that Iran doesn't develop the bomb, is there any other path besides war? I mean, look, if there is an alternative, neither Netanyahu nor Trump have put it on the table so far. Because again, we have even the former head of the Mossad backing the claim of the IAEA, who says there is no credible evidence at this time at all that Iran continued to develop a bomb after 2009. Now. It may have held on to this archive, which originally it developed in 2003, which, yes, potentially means that Iran did obscure the true intent and the extent of its progress. But without a plan B in place, the world is obviously very anxious to see what's going to happen if and when Trump decides to topple this deal. Well, obviously, we will be following the coming days very closely. Thanks yes. for joining us, Brett. Of course. One of the biggest unkept secrets in the region is Israel's alleged possession of nuclear weapons. While Israel is not actually a signatory to the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons Treaty, it's widely believed that Israel does in fact possess a nuclear arsenal. This has complicated the treaty's quest for a nuclear-free Middle East. But now, in a stunning reversal, the Trump administration has sided with Israel on the matter and says that Israel should be able to keep its nukes until the rest of the region recognizes its right to exist. 
Israeli rationale says that you can't separate the topic of nuclear arms from security, especially when certain enemy countries such as Iran, Syria and Libya are believed to be actively pursuing a bomb despite signing the treaty. For that reason, Israel allegedly developed a stockpile of up to 400 warheads, which, if true, would make it the world's third largest arsenal. Past administrations have typically held Israel to the same standard as the rest of the world and publicly asserted that Israel should sign the treaty and be transparent in its own nuclear activity. But clearly the Trump administration feels quite differently. The treaty is reevaluated every five years with the next meeting set for 2020 in Geneva. Some fear that by then the world may be a very different place with respect to nuclear power. In a roughly two hour long address given earlier this week to the Palestinian National Council, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas gave an alarming so-called history lesson in which he blamed Jews for causing the Holocaust and their own genocide in World War II. Joining me now with the implications of his speech is attorney, public diplomacy expert, and lecturer Ran Bal Yoshafat. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. All right, so, so what are your initial thoughts and reactions to Abbas's statements here? Okay, well, first of all, I wasn't really surprised. We have to remember that just last year, Abbas said that um, Israel is poisoning water wells of the Palestinians because of uh, orders from the rabbis. Um, the, he referred to uh, the U.S. ambassador as a son of a dog, not a different American phrase, because it's part of the um, conception that Jews are descendants of apes and pigs and dogs. So the concept of uh, the, the PA, the Palestinian Authority, being very anti-Semitic is not a new concept. What I think is very unique is the fact that right now the magnifying glass is on them and not on Israel. But I want to say one more thing about this, um, mm -hmm. this concept of them being anti-Semitic. The biggest test for me is the fact that Right now, every year, the Palestinian Authority is paying hundreds of millions of dollars to terrorists. It means it's actually more beneficial for you to conduct an act of terror. You get about five times more than the average uh, wage if you uh, commit an act of terror. And that, for me, is the biggest sign of anti-Semitism. Well, yeah, and, and we saw the Taylor Force Act, uh, you know, recently yeah. passed in, in uh, the state. So. How do these, let's just kind of talk about what this means for peace more specifically. How do these statements reflect on Abbas as, as a partner in peace? I mean, is he a partner in peace here? Well, it's a matter of opinion. In my opinion, the answer is obviously no. He was never a partner of peace. I would even argue uh, to say that he doesn't really have a narrative. He just has a negative. That's why he's always trying to undermine the connection between the Jews and the land of Israel. He's trying to basically take our identity and copy paste it to his identity. Um, so we cannot have peace with, with a person that's um, inciting for terror, indoctrinating children to hate Jews in his schools. That's not a sign of a, a peace partner. Well, I mean, he, Abbas has a long history of Holocaust denial going all the way back to his degree from Moscow and his... His dissertation. Yeah, his dissertation uh, called The Secret Relationship Between Nazism and Zionism. Um, you know, but there are some people who say that this rhetoric is just meant to, to please his base um, and that we shouldn't take it seriously. It's a very good argument, but the problem is don't just hear what he says in English, also see where he gives his money to. Now, if he will also have a change of policy, maybe, maybe he also had a change of heart. I find it very difficult to believe because, again, incitement in schools, giving money to terrorists, um, naming streets and town squares after terrorists who committed uh, suicide uh, uh, bombing attacks, that's not a sign of a peace partner, that's a sign of someone who has no recognition of Israel. Furthermore, um, he wants to establish a state, but he's calling for all of the Arabs in the world to come to where? Israel proper, not what he wants to be a future Palestinian state, which is very odd, because if you're going to create a state, I would assume you want your people to come to your state and not to someone else's state. Well, you know, going back to the, the Palestine National Council, the PNC, some expect Abbas to be either excluding political opponents uh, from the convention so that he can obviously shore up his own supporters in power, uh, or that perhaps he's, you know, maybe making one of his loyalists uh, poised to replace him at the right time. He is in his 80s, of course. What, what's going on here? What is most likely to happen? Well, in the broader picture, I think we have to remember that right now the world seems to be a little bit more pro-Israel, uh, especially with the current uh, U.S. administration, which seems to be leaning more towards Israel. And um, Abbas cannot seem to be moderate right now. He's fighting over who is going to be the head of the, the resistance, the rebellion that they're trying to have. So if he will seem too moderate, it's not going to work. Um, also, they have an inner conflict, of course, between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Um, and again, there's a big question, who's going to be the person who's going to rule right. this, um, this entity? 
All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your insight on this sure. topic. Thank you for having me. The head of the IDF, Chief of Staff Gadi Eisenkot, has just revealed that the army has thwarted multiple attempts by terrorists to kidnap soldiers along the Gaza border. These kidnappings, along with all kinds of attempted infiltration and attacks on IDF personnel, were all planned throughout the ongoing March of Return Rally. Eisenkot says these so-called protests are merely a cover for Palestinian terror. These are the same words echoed by countless Israeli officials, politicians, and analysts. But to hear them from the head of the IDF adds a new kind of certainty to the claims. Hamas initially announced that the rally would be merely a peaceful sit-in. But the terror group soon publicly announced that to the contrary, the true mission was to overrun Israel's borders and destroy the Jewish state. To that end, Israel has seen the weekly border rallies erupt into violence, along with dozens of attempts by Palestinians to either destroy or infiltrate the security barrier. Israel has responded with force, sometimes lethal force, when it deems necessary. Such action has drawn criticism from the international community who accuse the army of recklessly misusing deadly force. At this time, an estimated 44 Palestinians, including two teenagers and two journalists, have been killed by IDF bullets. Still, video evidence of protesters hurling firebombs, lighting tire fires, and trying to breach the border is easy to come by. These protests are set to coincide with the opening of the new American embassy in Jerusalem in just two weeks. Until then, we'll likely be seeing more bloodshed on the way. In other news, Israel's economy has just been reviewed by the International Monetary Fund, and though there is a lot of room for improvement, the Jewish state received top marks for economic growth, low unemployment rates, a healthy currency, and growing marketplace competition. ILTV's Aaron Porras is here in the studio with the details. Aaron, go ahead. Thank you very much, Natasha. And yes, as you said, we've gotten really great marks in this year's report, but the IMF uh, had a nice lengthy section of how to improve uh, Everything from you know the rising social gap to uh, issues in infrastructure and and more. Uh, and yeah. They well, say we what about Israel's you know top-notch high-tech sector or agriculture? Uh, sure. Can you be more specific about what areas really need to be addressed in terms yeah. of these social gaps? So yeah, I mean, if we start with infrastructure, that's an easy one. The IMF just kind of took one look at the congestion on on the roads here in Israel, and they said major changes yeah. need needed yeah. to be made. Aside from that, and addressing you know social gaps and, and education and things like that. They said, you know, again, a lot of work needs to be done. They said uh, more education core subjects needs to be regulated and enforced because take, for example, in many Haredi school, uh, no core subjects are even required, like math, things right, like that, of not course. required courses. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, teaching Hebrew more proficiently in Arabic schools so that uh, the Arab population can integrate into the workforce, teaching conversely Arabic to uh, Hebrew schools more proficiently so that we can integrate these people and absorb uh, those populations. Uh, school day, lengthening the school day, vocational training mm -hmm. and offering things, you know, for to fill these kind of labor markets that are empty. Well, I mean, don't students here already have six days of school? It's just a... It's, uh, it's quite busy. It's yeah. quite busy to begin with. That's true. But you, you, are, you did mention vocational training mm -hmm. as well, which needs to be offered to reduce um, the skill gap in, sure. in obviously an expanding labor mm -hmm. force. So... You know, obviously, I heard a lot of proposals, but they mostly seem to address the next generation of people that are entering the workforce. What can be done to address the poverty mm -hmm. um, and the income inequality that we're seeing right now here in Israel? So first, uh, you're right. A lot of this is kind of addressing the future. But as the report said, we're good right now. A lot of these issues are going are expected to hit mm -hmm. us harder in the future if they haven't already. Um, so as, as for helping, you know, in terms of poverty right now, they did. They also had some suggestions for there uh, for that yeah, some tax credits, major tax credits that are targeted, along with reports to see their efficacy mm -hmm. and change them uh, where need be, uh, lowering the housing market prices, things like that. Uh, you know, to reduce immediate uh, immediately the pressure on a lot of the people here in Israel. All right. Well, it certainly sounds like we have a lot to work on, oh, yeah. even though we did get some high scores here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, experts have just made an exciting discovery in the Dead Sea Scrolls thanks to some of the latest high-tech advances courtesy of NASA. The scrolls are, of course, the earliest known manuscripts containing what would eventually become the Hebrew Bible. Tiny fragments of the scrolls have actually been unreadable to archaeologists for nearly 70 years, but now new imaging technology has revealed the 2,000-year-old text, which was previously unseen by the human eye.
When these fragments were originally recovered from the Qumran caves nearly 70 years ago, the pieces were so small that archaeologists stored them in a cigar box. For decades now, their contents have been completely unknown. But now imaging tech originally designed for NASA space engineers has made a shocking discovery. One fragment actually contains letters written in anachronistic First Temple script. This is a potentially game-changing reveal because it means there could still be an unyet discovered scroll out there waiting to be found. A second piece confirms suspicions that another copy of the Temple Scroll, which outlines the conducting of temple services, is probably out there as well. A third fragment is only about as big as your fingernail. Turns out it contains only a single Hebrew word, Zamra, believed to be a part of Psalm 147.1. Experts say this piece completes a long-lost portion of the great Psalm scroll. The team have used this advanced technology to examine 82 long, overlooked shards of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This discovery comes right on the 70th anniversary of the scroll's discovery. In another 70 years, you can bet even more secrets will finally be revealed. Well, for a lot of people, honoring the memory of the Holocaust is more than just history, it's personal. And one woman inspired by her grandparents' legacy as Holocaust survivors has just come up with an unusual idea. She designs unique jewelry that features the Holocaust numbers that Nazis tattooed on Jews during the Holocaust. Her very first piece was actually a necklace with her grandmother's number in honor of her nana. Dana Rogozinski lives in Florida now, but she was actually here in Israel when she first got the idea. She was missing her grandmother and wanted to find a way to honor her and close the distance gap. Dana's grandma, Ella Lusak, survived the horrors of Auschwitz and eventually married Dana's grandpa, Jacob Rogozinski, who also survived Auschwitz. Dana fondly remembers how after they married, Nena Ella managed to get a job in a jewelry store where she worked for many years. Dana decided to turn the pain of the Holocaust into something beautiful by turning her grandmother's Nazi tattoo number into a piece of art. The idea erupted into an incredible business venture, and today, Dana runs Jacob Bella, named after both her grandparents, which makes an entire line of custom-made jewelry to honor the memory of those who went through the Holocaust. Customers can transform their family members' numbers into necklaces, pendants, bracelets, and for guys, even designer cufflinks. But even people without direct links to the Holocaust have bought jewelry, asking Dana to pick a stranger's legacy that they can honor. Some see this type of fashionable Holocaust wear as a rather morbid fashion faux pas. But for Dana, the whole point is to keep the memory of the Shoah alive and to keep the discussion going. And for that reason, a proceed of the sales are donated to Holocaust education and scholarships. All right, lots of what we say isn't just communicated through words, but rather through intonations, body language, pitch, and more. Well, one Israeli company has found a way to accurately read our voices and use that information to tell us things we may not have even known about ourselves. Here with the details is Voice Sense CEO Yoav Degani. All right, so we have heard of your startup. It's very interesting. Tell us what Voice Sense does exactly. So as you said, it's not what's, what they say, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So mm -hmm. we're focused on uh, speech-based uh, analytics, and we're actually uh, uh, focusing on intonation, pace. As you said, this is called speech prosody, all the non-content aspects of speech. But the interesting thing is that we were able we are able, when analyzing a person, we're able to determine his typical speech patterns. And more importantly, we were able to link those patterns to behavioral patterns, personality tendencies, behavioral tendencies. So we're able to predict future behavior based on speech Interesting. analysis. Interesting. So do you have a database, uh, essentially, of, of kind of medical conditions and voice patterns that are associated with them? What kind of um, diseases can you detect? So, so the medical um, uh, market is only one of them. The important thing to remember is that uh, our analysis is about typical behavioral tendencies or personality tendencies, and then we link them to different behaviors. Some of, of the behaviors are healthcare behaviors. For mm -hmm. example, people who are depressed, we proved in clinical trials that we're able to determine their typical speech pattern. So we can, for example, track, track uh, depressive patients daily through their smartphones and send alerts of a change in their uh, mental health state. Interesting. So in other words, by tracking, you know, my, any changes in my voice pattern, you could tell me if perhaps I'm 
getting depressed or I, I mean what are some of the conditions that you can outline can you yeah so that? within the market uh, the health healthcare market we're talking about uh, depression about general well-being about mm -hmm. um, uh, other men mental health um, uh, states for example were able hopefully it's still under uh, research to determine uh, substance abuse or post-traumatic uh, syndrome wow. uh, yeah etc but uh, we're able to do that for other markets as well, for example. So, so here's my question for you. I mean, is this available? Is this an app that I could you know, download on my phone to track my voice, or how does this work? You can. You can. Okay. Uh, it depends on the market that we're using it for. For example, ba banks or enterprise in general, telecoms, are using that to analyze in real time their customers uh. in order to predict whether they would what, are the, what is the probability that well, they would this is purchase amazing. online or what would be the style that they would For purchase? Sure. Well, clearly this uh, is technology that has a lot of different purposes and can be used in a lot of different ways. So interesting. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. Have you ever seen the band's visit? If not, trust me, find it on iTunes, search your Netflix, track down a blockbuster if you have to, it's worth it. The Israeli-made film is one of the country's contemporary classics, a comedy about an Egyptian band that gets lost in the Negev or the desert and accidentally winds up in an Israeli town. The film was actually adapted into a hit Broadway musical and it just scored a massive 11 nominations for this year's Tony Awards. With 11 nominations, including the top nomination for Best Musical, the band's visit could very well be the new frontrunner for the 2018 Tonys. The musical adaptations of Mean Girls and SpongeBob SquarePants technically have the edge with 12 nominations each. But for anyone who's seen the Israeli-based musical or even the original film, the band's visit will be tough to beat. The original film was released over 10 years ago. It was a massive hit at the time here in Israel, winning top honors at the Israeli Oscars. Israel submitted the film for the Academy Awards, but it was disqualified because the film actually contained more than 50% English. But even today, the fame remains an icon of contemporary Israeli comedies, as well as an impressive comment on Israeli-Arab relations. With a worldwide gross of nearly $15 million, it might also be the most lucrative Israeli film of all time, making a Broadway adaptation the next logical step. Golden Globe and Emmy Award winner Tony Shalhoub stars in the Broadway version, and the gossip mill is already clamoring that this might finally be the year Shalhoub snags the Tony for Best Actor. The show premiered last fall to critical acclaim, and tickets were already scarce before the Tony nominees were announced. So if you want to see this hit show, I suggest you get your order in ASAP. Well, here comes our Hebrew word of the day. The Broadway version of the Israeli film, The Band's Visit, just snagged a whopping 11 Tony nominations. That's why today's Hebrew word is tizmoret, which means a band or an orchestra. So there's obviously a big difference between a tizmoret or an orchestral band and something like a rock band. That's why there's actually a different Hebrew word for it too. A tizmoret is everything classical and sublime with brass, woodwinds, percussion, and strings. But make no mistake, a tizmoret may be traditional, but it's far from old fashioned. Just ask Elton John. The glam rocker performed one of the most epic shows of all time in 1986, backed by Melbourne's 14 piece tizmoret. Oh, and at the time, he was dressed up as Mozart. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy and with a chance of scattered showers. The low will be about 71 or 22 degrees Celsius. And tomorrow you can expect little to no change in temperatures and partly cloudy skies. The high should be around 92 or 30 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.6 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchuk and thanks for watching.